Good evening, this is What's Going On, I'm John Lee. Our guest this evening is Brett Lee, a member of the Davis City Council. Brett's about halfway through his term and he's got a lot of things to talk about. Brett, I want to thank you for being on our show. Uh, thanks for having me, John. For sure. So let's start with a big controversial question. You replaced Sue Greenwald on the city council. What's that like? Uh, I don't know if I replaced Sue Greenwald on the city council. Uh, there were two open seats, and Lucas Frericks and myself and Dan uh, were elected to the two open seats, and Dan is returning, uh, well, returning to a seat. So uh, I don't know that I would say I, I would replace her. Uh, I guess to your point uh, about uh, Sue, I think that Sue added a valuable perspective on the city council. I, I think some people take issue with maybe some of the personal dynamics that existed, but when you get deep down to it, um, she had uh, some very important points to make. Um, fiscal sustainability, you know, she was a big believer in making sure that the employment contracts were sustainable, and uh, she and Lamar spoke out against uh, some of the contracts that were in the process of being passed by the council majority. And with hindsight, we really see that Sue and Lamar really had a pretty good grasp about you know, what the dangers were about passing those uh, employee, employee contracts. As far as other things, I, I think um, she, like many uh, council people, had a, a lot to add. So I, I, I hear this comment about our current city council in that we're a bit too chummy, we're uh, a bit too oriented to trying to agree with each other. I don't think that really captures what's going on. I, I think what we try to do is try to stay collegial, but we definitely have differences of opinion. And I think, you know, you asked about Sue. Uh, I, I think what she brought and Lamar brought, and, and actually the other members of the council, was that it's okay to have some disagreements because policy is not a clear black or white, you know, right way, wrong way. I mean, there are nuances. And I think if the council's a little too like-minded, you can run into some problems. Uh, so I, I do hear from people that they think we're a little bit too eager to agree. I don't think we are too eager to agree. We've had a lot of split votes. Uh, but what you notice on the surface is that we're polite and collegial with each other. Um, but, but I think it is important that we do have different viewpoints and we are willing to disagree. I, I think what has changed over the past three or four years um, is that we're just a bit more collegial. I, first off, I think that it's imperative that um, the five members of the city council be different. So, um, to me, what, part of what Sue was reflecting is that there was, uh, uh, in my opinion, too much closeness among the other members of the council. And that led to Covell Village being given the priority for almost 10 years. And, um, and I objected to that a lot. So um, whether there's agreement or not within the council and how you deal with it is one factor. The other factor, though, is that the way Sue played out with other city councils and with other elected officials and with other bureaucrats was something that the city did not have a good reputation for. So that's part of what the city of Davis is living with now. The uh, degree to which you as a council get along is the beginning of having a city council. I mean, the whole point is to be able to talk about your differences and actually work through them. And I think when Sue was on the council, there was very little of that done, even when there was a majority vote that pushed things through. So I think it's imperative that you have. We're in the middle of shooting something. Please leave. Thank you. I'm sorry the light's on. Yeah, you didn't turn the light on. Sorry. I know. <laughs> That's why it's a good thing we have it on tape. Live would have been much more fun, though. Well, live, I've done that. I, the last time that happened, it was live. So back to reality. So um, 
They can keep that in the tape. That's fine. Well, we can. It, but because it'll look like it's spliced where uh, you no, know, we it, it won't it out be spliced. So you'd, be, you'd be amazed what Alex is going to do with this. So, um, actually, it shows us. Well, yeah, fun. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, is it, in regards to Sue, I mean, um, I'm not going to take the bait to sort no, of. No, I'm not asking you, know, you to. I, I think Sue brought uh, a level of knowledge, a level, a level of dedication that uh, really is commendable. And I think on a lot of the issues, you know, with hindsight and even at the time, I mean, people recognize that what she had to say was very important. Uh, I don't disagree that the council was a bit more contentious and the uh, interpersonal relationships were a bit more frayed. Uh, there's definitely some advantages in the, the current setup, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, in terms of what you want with your city council person, you want somebody who's going to advocate on behalf of your interests and ideally the community's interest at large. So I think that would be, you know, at least the top two, you know, within the top three items of what's important to you. The collegiality, the perhaps um, more polished interpersonal skills with outside entities and uh, amongst the colleagues, sure, that, that's a nice to have. Um, but people want to feel like they don't have to come down to city council chambers every single meeting to advocate on behalf of being a responsible, um, having a council member who wants to make responsible decisions. Having said that, um, I think there is uh, a definite plus in terms of the relationships with staff, the relationships with other communities, the relationships amongst ourselves in terms of how we're able to disagree, but then on the next issue maybe agree. And you mentioned something about the council majority. Right now there isn't a council majority. We, you know, uh, Rochelle Swanson and I uh, both um, voted to keep the, uh, the MRAP uh, pending further study. And, the military vehicle. Yes. And uh, it's a bit controversial, and there were three people who were opposed to that, and that was just the majority. Uh, just recently, Rob Davis and I were the council minority uh, voting against uh, the community facilities district for the cannery, and that was a pretty contentious 3-2 vote. But the following meeting, we you know, were voting again on different things, and so there isn't really a majority versus kind of the, the people on the outside. It's really... Uh, depending on the issue, the the three, the four, the five sometimes reform. So it, it is a it is an interesting dynamic. In 1984, when Bill Copper was the mayor, and I admired Bill a lot as the mayor, uh, Ann Evans, Tom Tomasi, and Bill Copper probably broke the Brown Public Meeting Act every week, talking on the phone, deciding what they were going to announce as decisions. Dave Rosenberg replaced Copper on the city council. And Dave Rosenberg, Ann Evans, uh, Tom Tomasi, and then Ann Evans, Tom Tomasi, and Dave Rosenberg, and then Corbett was the fourth one. So from 1984 to 1990, every week the Brown Public Meeting Act was violated, and then they announced the meetings at the city council. So in terms of what the Brown Meeting Act is intended to be, that was a majority that was solid, okay. They caucused every week and then they came in and they, they implemented their decisions. So by comparison, in 1990, we had the kind of council that we have now. And that is uh, Dave Rosenberg, uh, Lois, Susie, uh, Emaynard, and Jerry Adler. And they walked into the room and they'd had a dis have a discussion in front of everybody and then they'd make a decision. That's the way it's supposed to be, and that's the way you are now. From 2004 to 2010, we had a majority that made their decisions and then came in and announced the meeting. I think the way it is now is much better. It's the way it's supposed to be according to state law. Yeah. Um, so the idea behind the Brown Act is a, a good one. Yeah. It's basically discussions about policy should be out in the public. So public, the public gets to be a part of it and really sort of better understand the motivations for it. So um, I'm a big supporter of it. 
uh, it does create some difficulties in terms of the length of the city council meetings and also in terms of what information staff needs to provide. Because you might go and you go to a meeting and you think, you know, okay, this is what I think and I kind of hoping my colleagues think the same way and then they'll come at it from a different angle because you haven't sort of pre-caucused with them. And then you realize you need another piece of info and staff has only provided, you know, a set amount of information and may not have that other piece of info. So it does tend to draw things out and may mean that some items are extended to a future date. But in the overall uh, scheme of things, the, the Brown Act is a very helpful piece of legislation. And for the, the public, I guess, uh, basically it means that council members can meet, but we're limited to t discussing it with one other council member in terms of what uh, possible council items are and how we plan to vote or what we're leaning towards. We can't have a council majority meet off-site away from the public to pre-agree on a deal or something like that. Let me just say that Brad just read my mind and said what I was going to say. So thank you. Sure. So that leads me to the big question, which is now we have a city manager. Yes. We, when John Meyer left in 2000, we've gone through rotating city managers ever since then, either interim or not really for here, and then they moved on. So we have a new city manager. Explain the new, describe the new city manager and tell us about him. Our city manager is uh, Dirk Brazil, a longtime Davis resident who had been uh, working at the county, Yolo County, and we were very fortunate that he uh, accepted our job offer. We did a fairly extensive search to find a city manager, and his resume application rose to the top, and he was one of the finalists. We had a, a very good crop of people to choose from. Um, I guess for whatever reason, people you know want to be a city manager in Davis, so we we're very fortunate there. We had some good interviews with a variety of folks, and we decided that Dirk was the best fit. And the exciting thing about Dirk is hopefully he's the type of city manager that stays for a long time in Davis, and that it's not a, a year or two or a three or four type of thing and then gone. Hopefully it's uh, more like the John Meyer type of thing where they're here for a big block of time and they really help move the city forward. We have a lot of challenges. Um, I think Dirk is uh, definitely up to the challenge. And what's amazing is he started in the end of November and really hit the ground running and within a few days was, you know, you could tell the city manager was here. And uh, I think the, the three month uh, progress report is very, very positive. If I were to assign Dirk a letter grade, I would give him an A. Um, and I, I look forward to him sort of maintaining and improving, so perhaps uh, a year from now, it'll be uh, A plus or something. I, I think there are challenges, and I think some of those challenges are beyond the control of the city manager. So, we'll, you know, someone might hear me saying, "Oh, uh, you know, an A for the city manager. What about this, this, and this? You know, these problems." A lot of those problems aren't the type of problems that the city manager can just sort of magically wave a wand and fix. So we have some structural, don't know of any. <laughs> structural issues in terms of uh, pensions and things like that we really need to address. Those are problems that will be addressed over multi-years. It, it doesn't mean that we defer them. It just means that we have to nibble away at the problems over a couple of years and really sort of put into place a, a long-term plan, similar to the issues of our road repairs. We've neglected our ro roads for let's call it five to 15 years. I was gonna say 10 to 20 years, that might be a bit of an overstatement, but at least five to 10 years. To get back on track is not a one year turnaround, it'll be a three to eight year sort of process to get back on track. I'm optimistic about that. Um, but it is definitely noticeable that we do have a permanent city manager. I appreciated Steve Pinkerton, uh, Steve Pinkerton brought a lot of skills and talent and energy. Um, I, I feel it was unfortunate that he left, but I feel that we're very, very fortunate to have replaced him with uh, Dirk Brazil. So. so the question I want to get to is the weak mayor, strong city manager form of government. 
I'm not sure how I get to that question, but talk about what the city manager does compared to the city council yeah. so people can get a sense of the division of labor. And, and so the city manager has the responsibility, the authority, the power. So the city council has policy making responsibility and the city council actually is only responsible for two city employees, the city attorney and the city manager. I would put those in the opposite order myself. But. And the city manager is the one who actually runs the city. They run the city on behalf of the city council. The mayor is more of a ceremonial position, and so the mayor has no more authority than the other city council members other than the ability to help set the agenda in terms of things we discuss, and then also the position of chairing the city council meetings. Um, so people are a little bit surprised when they say, well, I spoke to the mayor and the mayor said this, so obviously this is going to happen. And um, well, really, the mayor just has one vote, one, one of five votes. So the mayor, just like you know, any other individual in the city council needs to find two or more colleagues to join in. And once you get to three votes, and then, you know, it becomes policy, essentially. Um, three out of five. Yes. So that's the definition of majority. Yes. So there are five city council people. One of them happens to be mayor, and that's based upon the person who received the most votes in the last city council election. And... Um, people are surprised about that because you know the mayor has a certain connotation. I know that before I became uh, before I paid too much attention to Davis politics, you would hear, "Oh, the mayor, this." You naturally sort of assume a strong mayor form of government, where the mayor would be a full-time position who actually runs the city. We see that in a lot of different locations, uh, but for Davis, it's the city manager who runs the city based upon the policy direction set by the city council. Um, it, the mayor um, does perform a very important role, though. Uh, they're the person who is kind of the face of the city council. They're the ones who uh, attend lots of different events, and um, you know, they're sort of the ambassador on behalf of the city council. So their workload is substantially higher than, well, they're, it's higher than other council people. Uh, uh, council people have the ability to attend a variety of events. But typically, when some entity is having some ribbon coveting ceremony, they, they first of all, they want to make sure the mayor shows up. So the mayor gets a, a lot of invites to things like that. When Jerry Adler was mayor for six months, he said that the, being mayor meant he got twice as much mail as he got not being a, from just being a member of the city council. So, and he said that a lot of it was meaningless, but he still had to go through it because that was part of the job. Yes. So for every 10-minute uh, controversy you have as a council member sitting up there at the dais, you have hours and hours of just sitting and listening to people give reports. The over overwhelming, that, that's what you do with your time is listen to people talk. Uh, or read emails. And uh, if there's one thing that I'm not very good about, and I probably uh, needed to have a New Year's resolution, and that's being uh, more responsive in terms of replying to emails. So we recently had an issue about green waste collection, about uh, we have the CLAW, the current system, and there's a desire by some portion, uh, let's call it city staff, for city staff and some portion of the community and some portion of the council to go to containerization of our green waste to, to eliminate the CLAW. We've uh, come up with a compromise plan where the CLAW will um, collect during the first week of the month and the containerized program will be for all four weeks but supplemented by the CLAW for one week a month. The initial staff plan was for just full containerization and the CLAW would go away other than special, uh, special request. Anyway, that generated a lot of uh, responses, uh, lots of emails, um, letters, actually, and phone calls. I probably, let's call it 30 or 40 emails regarding that, and it's not a, a one or two liner. I mean, many people take what well, must be 30 or 40 minutes to write out a, um, a well-thought-out email. 
And um, yeah, my weakness is just sort of juggling family, life, work. Sometimes when 10 of those arrive in one day, it takes me a while to respond. Sometimes I'm uh, a week or two. Uh, it, there's about a week or two delay before I actually respond. And I'm not always able to respond uh, to the depth that I would really like to. Um, so in answer to your question, yes, it, it's not always directly listening. I, I think the internet age has just uh, made email a fairly convenient way for people to reach out to us. So one of the questions I had was, how does being on the city council affect you? How's your personal life? What's it like to be on the city council? It's a challenge, uh, but it's really fun. Uh, it's really nice to learn so much more about your community. It really, uh, you know, so I talked about the emails. I get invitations to a variety of events from a variety of different groups, and there will also be citizens who have different issues. I recall an email about somebody who had collected stuff in their yard, and the neighbors were complaining, and this person wanted to show that, hey, he and his child weren't bad people, they just had some junk in the yard, but it wasn't, it didn't rise to the level of having uh, code compliance come and you know, uh, uh, require them to move all their stuff. So you know, I went and met, and you know, you, like I said, you just sort of meet all sorts of different people in your community. Um, that would be an example. In terms of policy, Davis is a, is, a, is a tough crowd. They don't really want you to sort of just rubber stamp what the staff report says. They want you to know what you're talking about. So a lot of people will come up and they'll ask me about green waste containerization. They want to know, well, what happens to the green waste? Where does it go? Why is that better than the claw? Well, you know, specifics like that. They want to know about the road uh, paving uh, program. You know, you know, if we do spend this much money on a paving program, ultimately, what does that do for our roads in 20 years? They want to know about the details of things like that. So you kind of need to be a policy expert on a good number of things. And I feel like we're very fortunate to have a very strong city staff. I know that sometimes um, community members get frustrated and council members get frustrated with, with staff. Uh, my experience has been the, the vast, vast majority of staff people have been very helpful and um, have a very high level of knowledge. Um, so that helps. So you, but you do need to do your homework. So in answer to your question, how it affects you know, my life or my colleagues' life, you know, who are also on the city council, it requires that you, perhaps instead of watching the football game on TV, that you read your staff packet. And the staff packets uh, can be like this thick. They used to print them out. And mm. now, uh, we have them um, on PDFs um, uh, that are put in our Dropbox file. We can read them on a computer or an a, a iPad. So several nights a week, I spend reading the staff report. And then from that, it's important to be a fairly knowledgeable person outside of council life because the staff report sometimes is not complete. And so you need to know what questions to ask. So you read something and go, hmm, I feel like we need a little more depth here. Let me ask a few more probing questions. So then you'll ask, and staff's pretty good about you know, uh, providing the answers to you. Um, so there is that time commitment. There is this uh, idea that you kind of need to know stuff, um, as opposed to a citizen comes up and asks you a question about something. And you go, well, I don't know. The staff recommended this, so I voted yes. And that's probably not good enough for most big issues. We have uh, some proposals coming up on some innovation parks. So this is going to be somewhat controversial. We're talking about a proposal on the east side of the community, east of Mace Boulevard, to uh, have a several hundred acre innovation park. And then there's another proposal that's moving forward. Uh, these aren't on the ballot. The you know, city council has not approved putting them on the ballot yet. But there's a proposal east of Mace, and there's one near Sutter Hospital, what we're calling the Northwest Proposal. It's not enough to just go, well, staff said it looked good, so we gave the thumbs up. I mean, we really know, need to know those proposals inside and out, understand what the negatives are, what the positive are, positives are, and really come up with a coherent sense of, is this good for our community or bad for our community? Because on most issues, 
it's not a clear, oh, this is good or this is bad. It's not this sort of binary thing. It's really there are shades of gray in between. And sometimes depending on you know, what side of the bed you wake up on in the morning, sometimes you, you sort of shift a little like, hmm, I'm leaning more towards yes or I'm leaning more towards no. And um, that kind of brings up the fact that at public comment, sometimes we have a lot of people who will come and make comment and they sort of say the same thing over and over again. For me, where public comment is of value is when people give me a different perspective or a different idea. I mean, sometimes um, you'll see it on the council. We'll, the meeting will be talking about the budget, and the one before, there'll be something about some trees, and the whole neighborhood comes out, and there'll be 25 people talking about trees and how we need to save the trees or cut down the trees. Uh, within a few week period, there was uh, a controversy about trees in uh, north of Davis that the neighbors deemed a fire hazard and they were you know, asking us to cut them down. In mm -hmm. West Davis, they were, had come out in force to say, please don't cut these down because there was a proposal to cut them down to improve the ability of the city to smooth out a sidewalk. So within a couple of weeks, you kind of have this con con uh, one group saying, you know, absolutely cut down the trees. It's a hazard to our homes. And the other, save the trees. We love the trees. Uh, so you'll have that big group. What's interesting to me is when, you know, we started talking about this, we sort of lament, oh, there's not that many people here talking about the budget, but we had 25 people to talk about some single tree, but nobody's talking about the budget. I think the budget's pretty straightforward. Um, that's a known issue that I know about, the community knows about when you're running for office. They elect you to deal with the budget in a responsible manner. They shouldn't have to come down and tell you, hey, be responsible with the budget. If they have to come down, then they've picked the wrong person to represent them. I will say public comment can be really useful when somebody gives you a different perspective or a different idea. So people have come and they've, you know, they've kind of said, oh, did you ever think about X? And then you think, no, I, I never thought about that. And you're the one person that's going to admit that. Yeah, I, I mean, you're, that's one of the great integrity things about you is your ego is not going to get... I, I want to interrupt and, oh, sure. and just yeah. add... I mean, I loved what you were saying. It was great stream of consciousness. and It was, it was all stuff that people should understand. I just want to add two things and see if I can remember both of them. Um, okay, the, anyway, the main one is that when it goes before the planning commission, staff has done all this work. Yeah. But the public hasn't really analyzed it or understood it. Even when you go through the Davis banking machine where they go through 10 different commissions, that means a lot of people that are in the 1% that pay attention to everything know about it. But even the 5% that read the letters to the editor every week and know what they're talking about, right. it's a new issue to them. That's number one. But number two, nobody knows who's on the planning commission except their friends. Most people that go to farmer's market that live in Davis, at this point, probably recognize you as a city council member. I would not say most. Okay, How about well, some. some. <laughs> okay, but the point is, they don't recognize, I, I agree. They, I mean, you're, you're, not, you're, we do know some people that were on the city council that that's true about, but that says more about you than it does about them. You're, you have, you're a very subtle personality in a, in a uh, megaphone reality. And you're trying to promote your ideas within the, the context of the structure. My point is that when it gets to be Saturday morning and it's on the council agenda for the next Tuesday and it was in Friday's paper, three people are going to walk up to you and lobby you about the issue. And if they don't say anything to you that you haven't heard about before, then it's not a surprise. But the point is, that's when people are going to start coming out of the woodwork. They're not going to come out of the woodwork until it gets to the city council. Right. But once it gets to the city council, all these people start realizing that you're about to change something that they care about. Sure. And, and in Davis, what I like to say is 1% of the people care. And that makes it dangerous to be on the street at 5 minutes to 7 if the meeting's at 7 o'clock. Yeah. So um, I forgot what the other thing I wanted to say was. That's okay. Go ahead about council dynamics. Uh, council manager dynamics. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, it's great having a city manager. It's great uh, working with my colleagues on the city council. Uh, as I said before, 
we've had some pretty serious disagreements, um, but we're able to kind of dust ourselves off and be willing to work on the next issue with uh, hopefully not having any chips on our shoulder or, or uh, holding any grudges. And I think that says a lot about us. I think we've sort of uh, moved beyond sort of uh, not being able to work together. Um, but, it, but it is interesting. I mean, we, we have had some contentious issues, and we will continue to have some contentious issues. I, I think uh, we're dependent on, um, you know, most people don't watch city council meetings. I don't blame them. I, I think there's probably a lot more. If they were uh, over at 9 o'clock, a lot more people would watch. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, and a lot of people do not attend or have never attended. And I think if people went and saw in person you know, the dynamics, they would see that they have some advocates on their behalf and there's difference of opinions. I, I think what gets summarized in the newspaper is, um, is helpful but I, I don't think it conveys the richness of uh, what goes on. Uh, I'm not advocating that that's necessarily interesting reading, but just in terms of you're kind of asking about the dynamics, I think the average person probably doesn't get a sense of that. Um, having said that, um, that's not necessarily uh, something amazing. I mean, you would, you would guess that a body of five people would have some disagreements, and you would expect that they would be mature enough to interact professionally and... Uh, and uh, work for the, the benefit of the community. Um, anyway. So John Myers come back. He, yes. He retired as the UCD Vice Chancellor for Management, Planning, and Budget. Um, and he's done some pro bono work for the city of Davis. Why don't you talk about that and what yeah. its status is and what you expect? So that actually reminds me about something. The city of Davis is really fortunate to have a lot of volunteers. We have a volunteer program that's administered through the police department, and the volunteers do like all sorts of things like you know adopting a park, uh, cleaning up parks. We have volunteers who serve as sort of downtown ambassadors who kind of show people around and uh, there's a whole bunch of different things. We have people who actually volunteer um, at the police station and who help uh, process things, and that's really wonderful. We also have a city commission program. We have, uh, I feel bad. I 27. We, we have, Pick a number. <laughs> we, let's call it 12 to 15 different city right. commissions, and the commissioners are volunteers. They typically meet uh, you know, once a month. Uh, you know, I'll just throw out a couple examples and, you know, Bicycle Transportation, Street Safety, Social Services Commission, Finance and Budget Commission, um, Human Relations Commission, Historical Resource Management Commission, uh, Recreation and Parks, uh, Natural Resources, I might have said that, Open Space and Habitat Commission, uh, there's a few others. All the people volunteer and they're extremely well qualified. If the city had to pay them as consultants, uh, it would be a huge expense. But we have professionals in the field. We have people who are uh, you know, passionate about the subject matter. We have a lot of university faculty who are subject matter experts who come over and help. Uh, that's a really wonderful thing. It helps give us uh, policy guidance. They are a, a way to, you know, staff comes up with recommendations and they're tempered with input from the commissions. And as a council, we look to the commissions to kind of give us a, a reality check on some of the staff's recommendations. So John Meyer, uh, similar to many of the volunteers on the commission, volunteered his time. Uh, you know, he really cares about his community and thought he would try to help out uh, with his special skill set, having been a city manager here in Davis for a long time. And a very uh, well-liked city manager, very well-respected. Uh, he came in and he spent uh, some time just going through the organizational structure of the city and just sort of coming up with his recommendations for how to improve the city. The, the report, I don't believe, is, uh, I don't believe it's been publicly released yet, so I can't really comment on the specifics, but I can say in general, uh, I found the report to be very helpful and very thoughtful and really I think along with our new city manager will allow us just to move forward that much more quickly. So um, 
anyways, I imagine it'll be uh, publicly released in a week or two. That would be my guess on the time frame. So John Meyer became city manager in 1990. He was manager until a little after 2000. Uh, the first thing he did after he got here as city manager, he had, been, he had previously been the assistant to the city manager for almost three years. Um, so the first thing he got here was he did a reorganization plan. He basically did what he's recommending to Dirk, and that is to reassess what it is that the city needs now and in the future, as opposed to what we've needed in the past. So um, I'll be meeting with John next week and get a copy of the report. I'm real interested to read it. Um, Actually, you uh, touched on the fact that he was uh, assistant city manager. We have a deputy city manager, Kelly Stakowitz, who kind of has been the glue that's held the us together while uh, you know Steve Pinkerton left, and then we had an interim and. Uh, she's really been wonderful and really helpful, and so uh, you know we've I've kind of sang the praises of uh, Dirk Brazil. I think it's important to, to mention her as well. Uh, she's a well liked, well respected uh, member of staff, and has a lot of institutional knowledge, and that is really helpful, especially when you have these uh, transitional periods. She came here in two thousand and five, and I can't say enough good things about her. Everything you said is true. Yeah. She's done an outstanding job, and sometimes it was very difficult. Yes, I can imagine. <laughs> um, no, sometimes even when it was good, she had to hold up the other half of, the, of everything because nobody else was. So sure. she's done an outstanding job. Um, so what's your laundry list? What are you working on? So for me, the, the big things are, um, Road maintenance, not that sexy or you know exciting, but our streets are literally falling apart. You know, I, I walk around my neighborhood and you know wander around other places, ride my bike in other neighborhoods, and everywhere you go, you see the signs of uh, neglect in terms of our roads and also uh, bike paths. So I would say that's number one. We are, we're working on that. We have more funding this year than we have had in the past because the citizens were uh, kind enough to pass Measure O, which is the sales tax measure that slightly bumped up our sales tax. So that'll give us a few years of uh, extra funding, which will be used to tackle that. Uh, so I would say that that's number one on my list. Uh, number two is sort of uh, kind of this mixed blessing. We're very fortunate that we have a dynamic, attractive downtown. The flip side is we have a dynamic, attractive downtown, and as a result, there's a parking. Uh, we don't have enough parking. Parking conflict. And when I say we don't have enough parking, that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have enough in terms of actual number of spaces. We have a parking management plan, uh, a problem. So we have uh, a couple multi-story garages, which uh, oftentimes, at least the garage at 4th and G, has open spaces. But people don't know about that. And we also have a situation where we don't have a way of incentivizing people to go and park in that garage if they're going to be for uh, downtown for longer periods of time. It seems out of the way. It seems like it's not part of the down. I mean, just visualizing right. Yeah. it right now. Yeah. We have kind of an interesting, you, you talk about visualizing. Somebody described the downtown as essentially the size of uh, Arden Fair Mall. And so we, uh, in terms of the actual sure, sure. inside, not the, the parking lot. Sure. Uh, for us, you know, I've been shopping at Arden Fair Mall for uh, 40 years or so. Since they built it. I remember as a kid, we would go to, there used to be a food court where the bookstore is now, like that, all these little international food things. Not where the current food court is, but... You know, but that was a special treat as a kid from Davis to go to Sacramento and you know go to the the mall. Uh, anyway, the idea that the parking lot at Fourth and G is far away, I kind of share that initial kind of reaction, like, oh, I, I want to go downtown. Oh, I don't want to park out of the way. But then when you think about the distance involved, if you were to go to Arden Mall and you were uh, you know, not advocating people's, you know. Um, spend money at retail establishments or anything. But if you were at Macy's and you said, oh, I want to go to Nordstrom or I want to go to 
you know, Sears, you wouldn't then think, oh, well, I have to go in my car and drive to be closer Two to blocks. that section of the yeah. mall. Yeah. It's really just a fairly convenient walk. Our downtown is quite pleasant to walk in. We uh, have a lot of uh, art projects. We have a, you know, art walk. We have, a, you know, we're very fortunate to have good weather, the lion's share of the, the year. So walking two or three blocks is not a big deal. I think we just have this sort of mindset. So in terms of addressing the parking issue, the parking management issue, I think ultimately there will be a shortage of actual supply. As opposed to right now, we have a shortage of supply in specific zones. I think the, the issue right now is finding a way to uh, create an incentive for people, like employees who are going to be downtown for eight hours, to maybe go park in the garage. And for people who are just going to be there for quick little trips, uh, hopefully they're able to park near to where they want to you know, jump in and jump out of. So um, that's kind of a big thing that I'm focused on. I would say those two things are, are pretty important. And yeah, there's other things that I'm you know, working on. But those are the ones that, to me, are, I would say, are kind of the highest priority. Other, other than kind of this ongoing, let's make sure that our employee contracts are responsible and sustainable. We got into trouble uh, a few years back, let's call it uh, five or six years back during the, the bubble. You know, everything was going great. The stock market was going great. CalPERS, uh, the, the entity that, is re, that the city pays into to help pay employee pensions, was telling municipalities, hey, this, you know, we're doing so great with our investment returns. You can give people better pensions, and you won't have to pay any extra in. Hey, it's the good times, no problem. And you know, we kind of saw what happened with the downturn. And so now CalPERS is saying, well, you need to contribute more. Oh, and next year, a little more, and then every year, more. Whereas what they were saying before was, hey, you may not even have to contribute anything. So at the time, you know, councils all over the, the city, or sorry, uh, state, you know, were kind of giving people better and better pension promises. We we're kind of left to pick up the pieces. So we, we do have a challenge. So we do need to be responsible about it. Uh, responsible about employee compensation packages. Um, we also need to value our employees and also recognize that if we're not competitive in what we pay, we could lose our strong city employees to other municipalities. So it's a sort of a, it's a tricky balancing act. Uh, it needs to be sustainable and it needs to be respectful and we need to find ways uh, in non-monetary ways to make people want to stay and work and help us here in the community. So I would say those are the big three. It, it should be worth, it a, a worth a lot to somebody to work for the city of Davis. It should be a valuable asset. It yeah. should be something that they're proud of. Yeah. There have been times when that hasn't been true. Um, many people like Kelly Stackowitz have lived through those times. Um, I, I want to explore your education because I find it interesting. Um, I'll just say that when I came to Davis 49 years ago, it was to become a chemical engineer and then get a master's in business administration, and I didn't. So I went straight to get a degree in econ and poli sci, so I sort of you know, skipped the engineering part. You didn't. Right. So you went to Berkeley and got a degree in industrial in, engineering. Industrial engineering and operations research. O-R. Yeah. So operation research is, a, let's call it applied math. Uh, sometimes in the business school it's called management science. But it's a um, numerical way of looking for efficiencies or optimization. We're going to have to talk about this off camera because I didn't know you were into OR. Um, yeah, so Berkeley, the degree is industrial engineering and operations research. Yeah. I'll just say that um, Stafford Beer, my favorite author, was the president of the Operations Research Society. So I know a little about what oper operations research was, but sure. not about what they taught you. Um, what I know what, about was what it was like 40 years ago in England. Well, you went to England to get your master's at the yes. London School of Economics. So yeah. that's what I'm interested in you're talking about. Yeah, so I went there uh, to study industrial relations. I, so industrial engineering is a pretty interesting field. 
um, I'll probably get some emails about this, but at its, to simplify it a bit, it makes this assumption, well, it doesn't make this, it doesn't overtly state this, but in terms of how you model things, how you look at productivity and efficiency and things like that, it, it tends to want to assume that people are like machines. Oh, you know, uh, a person can make 10 widgets per hour. We need 100 widgets per hour. How many people do we need? Oh, 10. Well, when you get out to the real world, you discover assembly lines. And assembly line is uh, machine paste. So you would think that an assembly line is assembly line. What you find is during different days of the week, the assembly line moves at different speeds in terms of um, the productivity. And you think, well, well, how can that occur? Well, it can occur because typically the assembly line can be slowed down uh, or there can be different levels of defects or things like that. So if you imagine that, uh, you know, the machine model of a human, human is a machine, you know, just, you know, does 10 widgets per hour, works for eight hours, this sort of thing. You would expect the steady flow and you would ex expect the error rate to be sort of, um, Consistent. It's consistent. It's sort of a typically normal distribution, depends. But you don't find that in real life. And I found out uh, when I was a senior at Berkeley, I took industrial sociology, which is a very interesting class because it talked about different types of things and talked about people uh, purposely sabotaging uh, machines and, you know, uh, braver men and all these sorts of different uh, topics. But you get out into the real world, real world. Uh, non-academic setting and you discover there's the union and there's management and the workers are angry because they, you know, they lost the, the grievance and so they're working slow or they're working fast or, you know, the various t other things going on and you realize you're just not equipped to deal with the complexities of the real life shop floor uh, in terms of what you were taught in the academic sense as an industrial engineer. So I talked to one of my uh, professors I actually took industrial relations as well my senior year at UC Berkeley. And uh, I believe this was Professor Garbarino. But anyway, I asked him, hey, you know, this is what I'm interested in. I'm, you know, I'm feeling like I need to know more. I feel like I know this much of the pie, but there's this whole other area of the pie that I just, you know, this, these dynamics are going on, and they're really about worker management, worker-to-worker -worker interactions. And the, probably the best school for industrial relations in the U.S. at the time was MIT, but that was more of a labor economics type of thing. And Cornell had a very strong prog program as well. And he, um, the, my professor, mentioned uh, London School of Economics because that really uh, talked about at the individual level. So that intrigued me. I'd never been uh, overseas, actually. Well, I'd been to Mexico. I'd been to Baja, California as a kid. Uh, not like at some tourist resort, but literally kind of driving along a dirt road down to Baja uh, before Highway 1 was fully paved. So, but I'd never been overseas, never been to England, never been to London. The little I knew about England was from what I had watched uh, on TV from the Avengers, uh, Emma Peel and John Sne uh, Steed, and then also EastEnders, two completely different sort of uh, uh, lenses on the life uh, of people in England. I applied, got in, ended up going, and it was a really great experience. It was, I happened to be ready for that experience in that most schools that I had been to up until that point, uh, using the assembly line analogy, you're kind of, as a student, you're on assembly line. Oh, week one, read chapter one and two, we'll have a quiz at the end of week, uh, sorry, week one, read chapter one and two, week two, read chapter three and four, and then we'll have a quiz, and then week three, read chapter five and six, and you know it's sort of, you know, sort of marched along, and you take Industrial a quiz. Industrial education. And then at the end, we will have a or halfway, we'll have a midterm, and then at the end, we'll have a final. And here's the percent on the midterm, here's the percent on the final, here's the percent for the quizzes, and you sort of march along. It's hard to stray because you're sort of, whoa, wait a minute, you know, here's this quiz, get back on track. The teaching system there was interesting in that you go and you have a, it's a seminar style, uh, style of education uh, for most class, for many classes. And so you go, you're given this reading list, and there's uh, 
20 different topics, uh, 20 different books for the week. You can't read all those. There's the three that are required, and then the rest are suggested. And you think, oh, well, I'm used to a system where you sort of do the minimum and you kind of, you know, well, maybe not the minimum, but you do the required and anything not required is not required. And then, but there's this whole other list. The professors make this assumption, which actually holds true for the lion's share of people there, at least in the graduate school, that you're interested in the subject. So they say, read these three, and you will have some additional questions. And then you can look and see which of these additional reading uh, you know, books or articles seem to sort of address those or you know, things that you're curious about. And so you would go, and you would have a discussion with your tutor, uh, the professor, and your colleagues, and you know, I might read, we'll read the top three, and I might have read the, the fifth one, and the eighth one, and the twelfth one, and you might have read the ninth, the eleventh, and also the twelfth one, and we'll have this really sort of interesting discussion. And if you hadn't read that, you're sort of a little bit left out, um, but you get to kind of listen and you know, add in, but you readily, you, know, you fairly quickly realize, hey, this is really interesting, Next week, I really want to read, too, because I want to be involved in this discussion. I want to bring up other points. And it was a, a great system. I, I must admit, um, it was a little stressful because you'll go the whole year, and your grade depends 100% on the final exam. And so you're kind of cruising along. You're taking part in these discussions. There's no homework, weekly homework that you're turning in. There's not really this essay you know, midterm or whatever. So you have three terms, and at the end, you have this big exam. And you think, my gosh, you don't really know how the English students are compared to you are because you haven't had that direct head-to-head -head comparison. So it was a little nerve-wracking. I'm happy to report that I did pass, but it was, uh, it was interesting, um, kind of just sweating it out before you go. Because there's this, this break about a month that's uh, exam revision time. Where it's interesting because up until the, that point, you see all your English uh, student colleagues are out. They're having a beer at the, the student pub. And everyone's kind of social. And you know, they're sort of going along. And then suddenly, everyone's gone. And you know, there's, uh, LSE has a bunch of American students. So I would say, I don't know, 20% of the students were American at that time. I, I could be off. But a, a fair number. And you kind of look at your you know, a fellow American, you're like, where did all the English students go? And then you discover they're all in the library. And they're all in the library, you know, like we would do here, the cramming for the cramming. Uh, you know, here it would be the week before finals, everyone hits the library. There it's a month straight. You know, maybe it's like this in law school, I don't know. But they're there every day, they're revising for exams, and uh, you know, they're very serious. And you're sort of going and you think like, well, I think I know my material. Um, yeah, it was it was a good experience. So so I want to break what you just sure. described into two parts. One yeah. is the testing, and the, and the other part is the student dynamic. I think that the, the experience you described is the way it's supposed to be in grad school. Yeah. If you go to a good undergraduate upper division seminar, that's exactly what they're going to do. The very best class I sat in on was from my roommate, and it was where a guy used the Socratic method. Um, and I'm blocking his name right now, but he walked in. Everybody had read the. Everybody in the class had read the material. Right. Thirty people in the class. He asked a question. Twenty people raised their hand. One person he called on. That person answered the question. Based on whether the answer was right or not, he asked another question. If the answer was wrong, he conveyed that in the question. But the notes that you took were what the students said. The students gave the whole lecture. Yeah. And that's the dynamic that you're talking about. Now, whether or not you get graded once a week or once a month or the end of the year is, is a different system. Yeah. And that's a, that's a whole different question. I mean, you can have a re I mean, you can have behavior modification where you give people an apple or a carrot or, or a stick if they don't get the answer right. But whether or not you do that every week or whether or not you do that at the end of the year is a sign of maturity. So only having a test at the end of the year puts all the responsibility on the student. Yes. So the other thing I have to say is I spent two weeks in England. 
And when I left, Al Gore was going to win the election. And when I came back two weeks later, Bush was about to win the election <laughs> because the media gave the election to, to Bush. And we won't talk about that tonight, but that's my analysis. Anyway, the point is that the, week I, the two weeks I was in, in Liverpool, Hull, and Lincoln, okay. which is Northern. in the Midlands, yeah. um, about where Manchester is, it's at that mid-level, halfway to Scotland, the main issue in the London Times about education policy was two people who were going to Harvard who were accepted at Cambridge. And who the hell would want to go to a school where you couldn't get drunk until you were 21? And that was the national issue. Now, there are two reasons to go to college in England. One is to learn to drink. The other is to learn how to match up with, match up with the opposite sex. And it doesn't matter what you study. When you go to college, you say where you went to school, and then you get patted on the back because that was a great school, and then they offer you the job. And then you perform, or you don't perform, and you're fired. Sure. It's, it's, it's a very cut and dry system. When, when I was, a, I'll end with this, when I was a sophomore at UC Davis, my TA had gone to Yale, and, and he laughed at us. Thank you. He laughed at us, and he said, you don't know how hard it is at the Ivy League schools. At the Ivy League schools, a third of the students didn't qualify. They let them in because they were special. And some of those people turn out to be the very best students, even though they didn't do that well in high school or prep school. By comparison, in the UC system, if you got in, you must be good enough. And so they just, you know, it's hard to tell what you learn in college. Hmm. But obviously, you learned a lot in grad school, and it was a great experience. It was, yeah. So we have time for one more question. Okay. Your term's about half over. Yep. What's the criteria you're evaluating on whether or not you're going to run for re-election? Pros and cons. Um, I think it's really about whether I feel like I'll, I'd be effective. Um, right now, I would say that I, I feel like I am doing an effective job on the city council. I think... Um, I think I try to represent sort of the average person in Davis, whatever that might mean. But just sort of, uh, I don't come at it from a strong ideological angle. I just really focused on what's practical. I think that probably comes from my many years of work as an industrial engineer. Um, so uh, for some, that might be a, a weakness, you know, sort of this maybe ideologically neutral, but really what's practical. And I, I think I've surprised some people. I think some people were surprised that I voted for the water project. But my assessment was is in the long run, we would be better off as a community having um, the water project and having access to the Sacramento River. Um, you know, on some things, um, you know, I recently voted against the community's fa um, community facilities district. Uh, the cannery folks were advocating very strongly on behalf of that. I voted against that. I've uh, also voted against uh, some other uh, development uh, proposals. Um, but that's just it's not that I'm anti-development. It's just my reading of what's in the best interest of the you know, average person in the community. And I kind of consider myself just an average person in the community. I probably kind of fit that, you know, just a homeowner with a you know, professional-ish sort of job. and you know, trying to make ends meet, and, uh, you know, I want to uh, ultimately retire here, and I hope that the school system is nice, stays nice and strong so that my uh, son has a good place to go to school. I want Davis to be uh, safe and, you know, friendly, and um, so, uh, you know, at this point, my assessment is that I'm doing an effective job, and, and that would really be my criteria, because um, it is a sacrifice. It is a fairly large time commitment. And so I don't really do it to, I'm not trying to get to a higher level of office that I have no aspirations like that. It's really just about sort of a kind of civic duty. And that sounds a little corny and, you know, people watching who don't know me might think, oh, well, you know, he, of course he's going to say something like that. But uh, people who know me and, you know, if you meet me at the farmer's market or wherever, I mean, I think they get a sense that that is a, a genuine interest that it's uh, really not kind of about me. It's really about, you know, I really like Davis. Uh, my family's been here since the 40s, and I want it to stay a nice place to live. We definitely have some challenges. Um, you know, uh, affordability is a real issue. 
And uh, I'd like to see Davis uh, be more affordable for people so that uh, people can move in and uh, you know, enjoy the nice lifestyle that we have here. So. I want to thank you for being on our show. Sure. Yeah. This is what's going on. Thanks for watching. Good evening.